Um, coming back, uh, especially after listening to everything that, that Danny was able to do with their office about moving cases out. You know, how do we keep people out of the system? And then most particularly, as we do things like divert cases, can we get the defense engaged in that practice? Can we get the defenders to do, uh, net in some of your programs, of reaching out to the kids and saying, you know, the, the DA and the police are serious about that program. If you go, it's like two sessions, this, this case goes away. So I think as, as we look here, and, and the topic being, how do we get the defense involved in reform um, and really make things happen? That, that that's, after, after seeing the great numbers, we're gonna move, move and go in this direction. Um, sitting to my right, and certainly not right politically, I don't think, uh, <laughs> while I'm pretty much a softie, uh, but, but we've got Drew uh, fiddling here, and, and he is the president of NACDL, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. And on behalf of APA, he had me down to his home city of Atlanta, uh, where it was his convening, the president's convening, and the issue was collateral consequences. And I thought it was such an honor to be invited to go to the, the defense conference, but even more particularly nationally, if on behalf of APA, if we don't get along with NACDL and also the NLADA at a national level, how can we ever expect at a local level that you see the defenders and the, and the prosecutors uh, working together? But the other piece he did was the issue, it was collateral consequences. And we've heard right away from Dan saying, why, you know, why do we have these collateral consequences? How do they affect or make our community safer? Or are they causing folks not to be able to get jobs and become, because um, a lot of reentry, many of the folks have never entered. So how do, how do we get somebody who does have some issues in there and being productive? So we've got Drew who's, who, who was a public defender. So we're, we're not crazy, we really did invite him to be here. Um, in, in Fulton County and now is out in private practice and moving around the country. Right to his right is Amy Wyrick, and I should say District Attorney General Amy Wyrick. Um, she came to the position uh, in, in January of 2011. She immediately had to run for office and won her first election in 2012, and then in 2014, she uh, uh, ran against somebody that folks saw on TV um, and sent him back to TV, hopefully. Um, and, but, but the one thing about that is in 2014, she won her term. I know we have a new elected here for, from Maine. We're talking about four-year terms. There is the jealousy that district attorneys general eight-year eight terms. Oh, wow. So um, it's the only fringe benefit. <laughs> the, 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 so, so the ability to really effectuate and, and do some change uh, because there are some bumps as we move in that direction. And finally, but last but not least, we, we have a federal friend with us. So uh, Ken Paulette was out of the Eastern District of Louisiana and was, was the uh, US attorney there. For those that don't know the geography, um, that is New Orleans. And so he had the honor and privilege of being the US attorney in a city that has so many different problems, but then also working and supervising, in a sense, the police department, the mayor's office, the district attorney, uh, but uh, from the federal side, how can, how can you make a difference? So I think because we invited the defense, we're gonna have Drew uh, speak first, that can we all get along, and most particularly, can we make a difference? Uh, first, uh, <clears throat> um, um, I'm delighted to be here, and you met Vanessa from our DC office. Uh, and so this is, this is a great invitation, um, and I was, Super excited to be here. How excited was I? I'm supposed to be speaking in Las Vegas today, and I skipped it to be here. Um, so I'm, I'm, is it? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting at a law school that wouldn't accept me, speaking to people on the other side. <laughs> Listen, it, I, spoke at, uh, I spoke at Emory University two nights ago where I went, and I said I'm speaking at Penn Law School this week and in two weeks at Cal Berkeley. I'm going to two places that wouldn't have accepted me. So. Uh, so, you know, we say uh, through our, our executive director, uh, Norman Reamer, he always says uh, that we're the only bar association, NECDL, that uh, goal is to put ourselves out of business. Uh, and as much as I give him credit for that incredible quote, um, when I listened to the presentation I heard last hour, um, I want to broaden that. Uh, we're probably the only two associations that ultimate goal is to put ourselves out of business. Um, I think we, we much 
more rather be in a, in a society, in a world where we didn't have to worry about sentencing anybody, let alone diversion centers, uh, uh, programs. Um, and I think that should be the starting point in answering the question, um, can we work together? Um, nobody wants to live in a society with crime. And so what can we do to truly suppress that? And, and that's my perspective uh, on the issue of collateral consequences. Um, and, and that any, any program that can result in somebody not having a conviction and not suppressing their ability to vote, earn a living wage, get a student loan, get a home loan, is, is worth our involvement. And, and, and so, but one of the keys to that as we talk for the few minutes uh, that challenge, challenges us is the issue of continuity. Um, and that is, we can have this conversation here, but will it impact um, our friends in Greenville, South Carolina, or our, our friends in Utah, Alabama, or our friends in Little Rock, Arkansas? Uh, to me, that's really the challenge. The challenge is to have consistency and continuity. Um, but uh, ultimately, um, I do believe that we need to work together. Uh, it's the only way to accomplish the end game. Amy, what, what say you and what have you done uh, within your own office to effectuate change, working with the defense, and then you've got some rural counties around that I know you've, you've assisted in the past. We do. So Memphis, Tennessee, I am as far west in the state of Tennessee that, as you can get. We are 95 counties. I am uh, the biggest county in terms of population. Well, Nashville, I think, maybe has a little bit more right now, but we have the most crime of anybody anywhere. We are the number one crime driver in the state of Tennessee. Um, my office consists of about 230 people, 120 of those are ADAs. Our caseload is typically around 180 to 200,000 cases every year. So when I hear Knighton and some of these other people from Manhattan talk about your crime numbers compared to your population and my crime numbers and my population, it gives you a picture of what we're dealing with. Um, so I have been in the office since 1991. I started there fresh out of law school. I've been a prosecutor longer than I've been a wife and a mother. Um, and we have spent a lot of the last seven years really looking at what can we do to move that public safety needle? Because let's be honest, a lot of what we've been doing for the last 27 years just isn't getting the job done. We had 226 homicides in Memphis two years ago. So something's not working, and, and what is it and what can we do to effectuate that change? Um, so one of the more recent changes we've made is to eliminate prosecution of financial driving on revoked. If, you are, if your license is revoked in Shelby County because you owe somebody money, our office is no longer going to prosecute those cases. And that was a huge lift internally, um, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit that when you Maybe the Manhattan DA's office is a little bit different, but sometimes when I talk about these policies internally, I get a lot of strange looks across the table. Like, you know, it's not my job to be a social worker. It's not my job to fix that problem. If we are not supposed to be enforcing these laws, then the legislature shouldn't be enacting these laws, that type of conversation. So this was a big, heavy lift, and we did it internally. In the first month of rolling out this policy, we have eliminated 45% of our general sessions docket alone just with that policy. And when I brought the prosecutors together to announce it, I had a young assistant in our office who used to be a public defender who I'd recently hired, and he raised his hand and he said, so let me get this straight. You basically want us to have time to do the things at work that matter to the public and to stop wasting our time on things that don't matter to the public. And I said, you're a genius, and I'm a genius for hiring you. So, um, but it, it, it takes more of that, and it takes more of the group effort, not just within the DA's offices, but reaching across the aisles to our partners in the defense bar. And I mean, oftentimes, let's be honest, sometimes the biggest obstacle we face in change sits in the robe in the courtroom on the bench. Um, and those are the challenges that I think when we're united, we have a better shot at overcoming some of those. And let's hear from our, uh, our federal friend. 
Uh, so I am now a resident of Philadelphia. My wife uh, is, is a resident and uh, originally from Philadelphia. This morning I sent out a tweet uh, where I basically said, you know, look, we're transitioning to Philadelphia. Things are going well. It's snowing here today. Um, <laughs> on an unrelated note, we will be spending Thanksgiving back in New Orleans. So um, I'm happy to be, uh, to be here today. Uh, I do want to start off my comments because it, I think it helps frame really my own perspective about my approach to the job as U.S. Attorney. Uh, it begins really several years before I became U.S. Attorney on September 4th of 2005. This was days after Katrina hit the city of New Orleans and the police department received a report of shots fired on the Danzinger Bridge in New Orleans. Uh, unmarked police cars, ununiformed, plainclothes officers responded. They observed a group of two different groups of uh, unarmed citizens, uh, and without announcing themselves, they began firing and firing and firing. And ultimately, uh, as a result of that incident, we lost several American citizens. Uh, I know at the time of Katrina, several people from New Orleans were being called refugees. These were American citizens that we lost on that bridge. Uh, and in the aftermath of that Danzinger Bridge incident, there was a circle of silence, there was a cover-up, there was a failed attempted prosecution by the DA's office, and ultimately, the federal government stepped in, and the office that I ultimately came to lead did receive very substantial convictions and sentences of those officers. I'll come back to what happened after that. Uh, but as a result of that incident and many other incidents uh, involving the New Orleans Police Department, which by every measure was considered one of the most corrupt, most uh, damaged police forces in our country, uh, we ended up instituting a consent decree on the New Orleans Police Department. Uh, honor and distinction of the city of New Orleans, it has not one but two different consent decrees uh, for both its prison as well as for its police department. And one of the key hallmarks of that consent decree was a concept that we call EPIC, that's ethical policing is, cur is courageous, and that was a program that was designed and now is being implemented in conjunction with the police department by our office on the prosecutorial side and the defense bar uh, in New Orleans, uh, where we are essentially taking the models of peer intervention. Peer intervention is a concept that's used in our hospitals, it's used by our pilots and airlines where one particular individual is trained to intervene where they see their brother or sister going astray. It has never been implemented before on the law enforcement side before New Orleans implemented it. And it is now a true success story. And it is all to the goal of preventing another incident like Danzinger ever coming to play again. That Danzinger Bridge incident uh, ultimately, the most significant civil rights conviction in the history of my district, that case was overturned for prosecutorial misconduct uh, by the office that I came to lead. There was a, uh, a group, uh, two individuals in leadership in the U.S. Attorney's Office who were identified as making inappropriate comments online related to pending cases uh, in the district. Unheard of conduct by a prosecutor. Uh, and that decision was overturned literally one day before I was sworn in as U.S. Attorney. And so that was the office that I inherited. It was an office where the U.S. Attorney had been there for 13 years. He was the longest serving U.S. Attorney. And in many ways, his relationship and the office's relationship with the defense bar was absolutely non-existent. And by non-existent, I mean that he had never had a meeting with the federal defender in the 13 years uh, that he was there. Not once. Uh, and so one of the things that I focused on when I first walked into the door, in, including lifting the morale of the office, is just reinvigorating the concepts of professionalism and what it means for us to be part of the same system with defense attorneys and with, uh, with the judges and with the probation office and being part of a court family. Uh, we became the first office that was trained uh, on the Department of Justice's new social media policy. Uh, we began having defense attorneys who regularly practiced in our office come into our office as part of our CLE and talk to us about what we're doing well and what's not going so well. And that was uh, a diff difficult pill for some to swallow in the office, <laughs> as you could imagine. But I thought that that was worthwhile. 
And then ultimately my relationship with the public defender, with the federal defender in our office, was absolutely critical and one that I focused on improving uh, from the very beginning. And we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about the work that we accomplished together as well. And I think that might be a great segue as we move back down, down the row again. Um, tell us about what you did with the defense. And I, and I think while locally there have been so many diversion deflection programs, we don't hear a lot about the, the federal office. Yeah. Are, are they, too, doing similar things, and if so, how? Yeah, we, 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 we were. We've been uh, doing a reentry court for several years now, Rise and Recover at the federal level, 14-month 14 14 program, uh, post-release uh, 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 intervention where individuals are getting counseling and job training, job placement. Uh, they're getting CBT as well, and then ultimately they're getting a reduction in their supervised release of, a, of approximately one year off of their supervised release if they're successfully completing that program. One of the things that we thought about, though, was what if we, instead of waiting until folks get out of prison, what if we tried to do something on the, the, the beginning side of that process and, and intervene in the lives of those individuals who, are, who we know are caught into the, the web of a conspiracy or drug conspiracy, perhaps drug mules, um, who are at the lower rungs of a conspiracy, who are there because of a substance addiction, uh, what if we intervene in their lives uh, earlier and prevented them from being captured into the criminal justice system and, uh, altogether? And so what we did was we actually did travel around and observe some of the programs um, that are on the early side, on the, on the pre-conviction uh, side of things, and went to Brooklyn, we went to uh, Illinois to their PADI program and saw some of the success stories that those programs were having. And ultimately, people who went through those programs, they got out and they, 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 they received a substantial reduction on their sentence as a result of uh, successfully completing those programs. When we replicated that in New Orleans as part of our LEAP program, again, this is myself and our federal defender who traveled around and observed these programs. That was the federal defender and I who traveled around and met with each and every district uh, judge in our district to advocate for the, the reason why we needed this program. And ultimately, the way that that program was formulated was we identified these individuals, whether they come from referrals from our agents or from defense attorneys or from our prosecutors, but ultimately, if they are successfully completing a pre-conviction program after a max of two years, those are individuals that are not going to get just a, a reduction on their sentence they actually walk out of our criminal justice system at the federal level without a conviction at all. And so they are never stamped with that scarlet letter of having a felony on their records at all, and they're able to, to continue their lives successfully. That was one of the, the hallmarks of our work there. And, and did I hear you went to the federal judges with your defender and tried to get them to? We did. Yeah, we did. Amy, Amy talked about work. robe issue at the state level. How's the robe issue at the federal level? I'm sorry, I said that again. <laughs> I said Amy mentioned having a little problem with the robes at the state oh, level. The, yeah. Yeah, what's it like working the federal level with the uh, folks in the robe? Yeah. The I, ones I, there I, for life? Is, the, is that the right term? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, a little Article 3 there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that, you, that we focused on was, was having the right advocates there. Uh, you know, obviously there are some that politi politically were more aligned with doing a program like this. But then one of the people who we really focused on was, was a former AUSA in our office, who was formerly the criminal division chief in our office, who is generally considered the most hardline sentencer in the court, and we converted him. He was, the, he was one of the key people that we focused on getting his support very early on. And once we, once we got him online, once we got him on board, and he ultimately agreed to be one of the supervising uh, judges for the program itself, we knew that the rest of the court would come along. Amy, I, I know that your uh, defender gets out a bit and talks about things. Is it always easy and comfortable to uh, have him along? And, and are there situations when he speaks or situations when you speak as far as building up alliances or, or trying to change things? Uh, you know, it's, it's all rainbows and butterflies in, uh, in Shelby <laughs> County. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, there, you know, there are good days and there are bad days. There have been, when you called and asked me to, to be a part of this, you said, you know, just make a list of those things that you've got going on in your office that are a partnership with your, with your defense bar. And um, there are some of those, but there are also many instances where we've just had to say, look, we're just going to do this, and here's what's happening in our office, and you guys can either come on 
board or not. Um, two recent examples of that, one was a prostitution diversion program that we wanted to start in our office, and we knew that it wouldn't do any good to start this great program, just like all of you have wonderful programs, if the defense bar was not going to take part of it. And what it did was divert these prostitution cases to attend a class, to be um, put into contact with human trafficking rescue organizations and things like that so they can get services. But if a defense attorney was just going to tell their client, don't, don't go to the stupid class, just we can get you time served on this and get you out the door, we weren't going to be able to get any of the good work done. So having those conversations, and it took several meetings with both private bar and, and our public defenders to say, look, this is what we want to do. We think this is the right thing. And now um, it, it's humming along and going beautifully. The other example was community prosecution. We recently piloted that in Shelby County. We put two prosecutors out in um, two of our police precincts. We had it geographically based so that those arrests came back to certain courtrooms back at the ranch, and the public defenders loved it because there was verticality within their caseload. We loved it because there was a verticality. Well, then when it came time to expand that program to the other judges, we met with resistance from our public defender not wanting to be seen as locking arms with us in this program. So while they were supportive of it behind the curtain, um, didn't want to go out front and help us fight with the judges on it. So we've just kind of had to take the bull by the horns and, and figure out a way to, to get that work done without the butterflies and the rainbows. I mean, I think, you know, at the end of the day, we, we can all say it in, in many different ways, but no matter what hat you wear, no matter which system you represent or which agency you represent in the system, I think anybody would tell you all we want to do is make sure that the worst of the worst, the most violent members of our communities, no longer harm people. And oftentimes that means we just seek the maximum sentence for them. But for everybody else, if the system were designed in a way that we had the luxury and the evidence-based resources for a prosecutor to sit down with a defense attorney and the defense attorney's client and say, okay, what's it going to take? Which, which door do you want to go through? Which program do you want to take a part of so that you stop victimizing people in this community, so that you stop stealing, so that you stop with your drug addiction, so that you stop with whatever it is that is driving you to commit crime? How can we craft that menu of services for you so that we never see you back here again? Because that's what, every, that's what everybody wants. Um, and it's for that very small population of the people that we deal with every day uh, that are going to go to prison and never get out. Everybody else is coming back to your neighborhood, my neighborhood, and your neighborhood. And what can we all do together uh, to, to make sure they no longer victimize people? So let me, um, you know, you guys don't want too much kumbaya. I've got to give you a reason not to like me. <laughs> uh, so uh, let me... Uh, uh, respond to what Ken said and uh, you know it's funny I, I said to Ken when when I first walked up I had a case in his district but um, whether it's uh, Professor Larson at Tulane um, Bob Glass you know mm -hmm. the old timers yeah. and, and Jason Williams the hopefully the future district attorney um, you know I've heard nothing but but great things about how innovative and progressive um, that you've been that being said let me just give my global perspective on the federal system um, I find the federal system we have any AUSAs here Okay, good, because guess what some of One, for, one <laughs> former, one former. One in leadership, so, my good friend. Tom so Michael. globally, and I, I've... <laughs> a couple there. Okay, yeah, yeah, good. Just drop it on, get ready for this one. Um, uh, I, I, <laughs> uh, a a, a uh, large percentage of my case cases are federal and all around the country, so I feel comfortable in saying that I find the federal system to be an elitist system. Um, uh, you know, you often get questions, you know, are you a state practitioner? Just that question to me is an elitist um, statement. I find federal judges to be elitist um, because they sit on the federal bench for life and think that to practice before them and to have a federal case. Sometimes I feel like my clients that get charged with a federal crime are treated better by the court because they're in the federal system. Congratulations, you've committed a federal offense. Um, and, and, and that if it impacts my friends in federal defenders' offices uh, around the country. There's this sense that what happens there is more important, that the system is more important. Um, but not everybody around the country is progressive and innovative like Ken. And, and so to be charged with a federal uh, offense is often means there's no diversion. I mean, I look at the listservs around the United States, and people throw in the towel on diversion, let alone 
getting their cases reduced to misdemeanors. I mean, Ken, if you saw the number of listservs where we, the same listserv goes email, is always going around that lists the hundreds of lesser included offenses. And then you, the next day you get it where I didn't get that. Um, I was fortunate to be in Buffalo recently and actually got a reduction, believe it or not, to a regulatory offense. And I thought that was really progressive um, because it gave this young kid that was actually 19 at the time the opportunity to have a future. We just don't see that. We don't see that sense of innovation and progressiveness. Um, now, we're, we're, we're fortunate that we were here talking right immediately after um, this criminal justice reform uh, bill is, has been proposed. But what percentage of people is that really going to impact? I mean, we're talking about the federal system. We were talking about that beforehand. The problem is the general public, who you really want to support all of these diversion programs and, and great, you know, veterans courts and, and the one 18 to 20. I mean, I'm already texting back home. That's just brilliant. Uh, but the general public is going to read about this and think that's going to affect uh, the, the, the scores uh, of people, the, the almost 20, rising to 25% of incarcerated population that we have. And what is it really going to impact? Um, that type of innovation, though, however, needs to, uh, well, you know, needs to go back and forth. And, and I just don't see, generally, that leadership across the country coming in the federal system. And that's a problem um, that I see. Regarding the issue and of- I, And I will, let me just say, yes. I obviously served under a very different administration. Exactly. <laughs> where the, the attorney generals that I served under uh, did value the, the significant voices that they carried from a national platform and empowered the various U.S. attorneys across the, across the country to try to become community problem solvers and tr try to be as innovative as possible. That's a, it's a very different model from what I think what we're seeing right now for the DOJ. It, 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 completely different. And we've seen the sessions come. The, the, wow, was that a Freudian slip? I said sessions. <laughs> Um, we, we've seen the changes uh, that came, the, the negative commentary about the use of marijuana uh, ca came out immediately. And the scorn, um, the scorn for a clemency project 2014. Um, I, I know a lot of you know about it, and we talked up here about it, and I know, uh, you know Ken was very aware of it, um, and, and that is that there was a clemency project uh, through President Obama. And most people know that President Obama wasn't so easy on criminal justice. I mean, he was more of a hardliner than you would think. Um, but he did have this, uh, this incredible collaboration, um, including our organization, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, where we were going to go back and, and look in retrospect at these cases. And um, I sat in, in a meeting uh, where one of President Obama's lawyers came in and said, here's the deal. He will participate in this clemency project. No guns, no sex. He will not sign a clemency petition if there's drugs or sex involved. And under President Obama, almost 2,000 souls went back to their families. Under this administration, Kim Kardashian happened to befriend, uh, happened to befriend Alice Marie Johnson because she watched a six-minute micro documentary about her and presented that to this president. So I, for one, like the number 2,000 versus number one. Um, but you're right, it, everything changes so quickly. Um, and I, it's unfortunately, though, because people look to that federal system because the general public doesn't realize. Mm -hmm. So, and one, go, one thing on the clemency piece, and I, I think yeah. that this is worth uh, fleshing out a little bit. In that clemency project, one of the critical voices that DOJ turned to or that the White House turned to was the actual Department of Justice. And before the, the clemency application was signed off on, my office and every U.S. attorney's office in the country got an, op an opportunity to comment on whether this was a worthy application or not. I would say that some are now questioning whether prosecutors should even have a real role in that process. And you know, there's some criticism of the way that the Trump administration is handling clemency, but at the very least, it's not simply relying on the Department of Justice to check yes or no before it goes to the White House. There's a little bit more independence there, for well, better or worse. And, and I want to say this as you each go back to, to your homes, your jurisdictions, um, there is a movement that we're actively involved in, our executive director is actively involved in, and that is to take the infrastructure um, that it takes to do a clemency project and move it to the states. And New York has, has partnered up with us, and there's a couple of the states that are interested, and it takes a, 
incredible, massive amount of work. Um, we really need big firm involvement because they can dedicate, um, you know, like uh, uh, President Obama had so many, um, such a, a lengthy checklist mm -hmm. um, through through um, Attorney General Holder that we had, and only a big firm that can dedicate 30 attorneys at a time to go through that checklist. So for those of you in different states that are interested, you should be thinking about that. I do want to talk about um, the verticality. Um, so I'm going to give you the defense perspective on verticality, uh, and, and that is... Don't scorn us if we take the position. We'd love to get somebody into that diversion program immediately, but they're actually innocent. Um, because we have to be satisfied that an offense was perpetrated before we want to put anybody in a program. Um, so, you know, please have that in mind um, when you get the defense bar that says, well, just hold on a second here. Um, you know, for some people, like in an anger management program, uh, you know, where I live, 24 week commitment is a lot. I mean, it's a lot, it's a lot of missed work, it's a lot of missing being around your kids, and we wanna make sure, we wanna be satisfied that an offense has been perpetrated uh, before we do that. That's number one. Number two is that th these type of programs, there needs to be uh, in an immediacy uh, about it, and it should not substitute the burden on the prosecution to me to see a case that I would call a dog case. And if it's a dog case, have the intestinal fortitude at your office to call it a dog case and throw it in the trash can. A, a diversion program and a progressive program should not substitute in the ability to identify a bad case. I feel like I have, um, I talked to a, a, a prosecutor in Cobb County the other day that just retired, and I said, I'm, so I've now officially become the person that says, in the old days, um, in the old days, we had career prosecutors um, that would see a case and go, this is a piece of garbage. I'm not going to prosecute that. Uh, now, I'm just speaking, you know, regionally. Um, the problem, at least regionally, that I see where I live is that, um, you know, we, there was a day where we had 20, 30-year prosecutors. Right now, we mostly meet people that are two- or three-year prosecutors, and they just don't have the experience to identify what I would call and what seasoned prosecutors would call a dog case. So I just don't think... Diversion is the greatest thing in our, in our system, and, and innovative ways of diverting cases and giving people the, the opportunity to have dismissed and expunged cases is fantastic. But it should not be, it should not be a substitution for the ability, not just to try a case as a prosecutor, but to identify a case and say it's not a real case. Yeah. Well, I, I was looking at uh, John Chisholm up there um, on, on the concept, and I think that's why the defense bar has to be involved is with, with his early, and I think it's about, you said 30%, I think last time you spoke, of cases that are getting diverted out, that if the case is not there uh, on behalf of the prosecutors, that's, that's the one that, that doesn't even, that's a non-starter as it relates to diversion. But, but I think that's why the role and, and the importance of having uh, folks defended uh, so there can, can be that check. The other prosecutors speak, when you file a dog case, you need to put a leash on it and, and take it home with you. <laughs> uh, you, don't, you don't get to put it in there and, 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 and let someone else have that problem. So all of us have, have taken project cases. That's but great. yeah, that's the thing to remember. Yeah, put a, you hang, hang on to it. The, the other thing, I, when I introduced Amy, I failed to recognize her as an APA board member. And then um, Nitin's discussion, DA Vance is also on our board. Why do I bring this up? You mentioned the First Step Act. And everyone can say it's, it's not perfect, it's not, maybe it's not far enough. But I'm going to look to Dan because originally, when it was Senator Leahy, Durbin, Lee, and I don't even think Rand Paul was around at, at that time. I think we were eight years in, in the making of that. There was a real question, do the local prosecutors weigh in on federal sentencing? And, and Dan was one of the voices saying, wait a second, look what they're giving on drug cases. If we don't weigh in, if we don't lead the federal system a little bit, then we get blamed anyway. So let's get in there because of the disproportionality. So while it's not perfect, we were very early supporters, as, as was the previous administration, about saying there, there needs to be some changes and we need to get some more uniformity and look more to where the states are. I'm gonna talk about uh, President Trump yesterday. When he announced it, he looked to Georgia, Mississippi, and Kentucky. Is he, he picked out what he thought was very red states, saying, look what these governors have done and I'm going to do the, the, the same thing na uh, nationally as to as what the states are. So the states are kind of those incubators, but I think it's an incredible point to say 
yeah, it, they need to be good cases. And, and there is support also for, for uh, the defense accusation, because if you go back to the 60s and the Johnson administration, that's actually what's written up about a diversion. If you have cases you can't prove, those are the cases that you divert. And I think that that's contrary to the practice that, that's, that's occurring throughout the country, is you only divert the cases that are real. Um, and, and Amy, you, you mentioned, and I don't know if folks caught, 45% of, of yeah. caseload reduction. Yeah. I mean, doesn't that mean now, especially working the, with the defense, that you can actually put your resources towards uh, real cases or cases that make a public safety difference? Yes, I mean, the, the short answer is yes. Um, so it gives them the energy and the time um, to to focus on what matters. The other thing that we have recently implemented, and I think um, this has paid off collateral consequences that we didn't anticipate, good collateral consequences, um, is we've asked every prosecutor to, to call the victim. As soon as possible in the course of the prosecution, pick up the phone and call the victim for a, a couple of reasons. First of all, find out if there's information not contained in the police report that might be helpful. Sometimes the police charge one crime and you find out it's something completely different. Um, also, find out what does the victim want from this? Uh, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I'm often shocked at how far apart sometimes our mind is on how a case should be resolved from where that victim's mind is. Uh, and when you start talking about prison time potentially to a victim, you often hear that, oh, well, no, no, I, I don't want anybody to go to prison for this. It was, you know, here's what happened, here's what we'd like to see. We just want to make sure they don't do it again. So it gives that prosecutor, and many of these are very young prosecutors, to your point of the two and three year, starting to develop that ability to uh, value a case. What is this case worth? Um, you learn the best of a case value when you get your ass kicked by a jury on a Friday afternoon and the whole office is up there to watch the verdict come back. Um, <laughs> those are great lessons, but it, you got to work a little bit before you have those lessons. But in between there, just learning what that case is worth to, to the office, to the system, and to that victim is helpful to the prosecutor and helps with those conversations with defense counsel. Because otherwise, oftentimes, we're relying on them to bring us that information. You know, we've talked to the victim, and here's what they say. Um, so that, that's had a, a, a good impact. Amy, it's, a, it's an interesting um, use of words there when you said, how much is a case worth? I, I don't want to put your, kicked. well, no, exactly, right? <laughs> About the question of diversion and the following the money there, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that uh, is happening in Louisiana, at least, is that and you know, granted our system was fairly perverse in a lot of different ways, but when you get court fees in, that money is then split between funding the, the public defender and the courts and the sheriff gets a cut and the DA gets a cut, mm -hmm. as opposed to the diversion programs cuts the, everyone else out of those court fees and only the DA gets to keep that whole, the, the money that they get for the diversion programs. Can you talk a little bit about how that funding piece works within well, that, your... That is not our model yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I guess I can't speak to that. Well, I would just, we don't, if you could talk a little bit about how, what happens to the, the fees that you might collect for the diversion the, program. On the driving or revoked yes, situation? Yes, yeah. Well, and that's an interesting piece mm -hmm. to this that I'm waiting for the backlash to hit from the Department of Safety and the clerk's offices who are owed these fines and fees because mm -hmm. um, the cases that we have put the kibosh on, those are the agencies who are owed the money. You either owe the money for back tickets and parking is situations or you owe the money from past criminal convictions. I mean, our system is set up in a way that you've done your time, you've been on probation, you've done your sentence, but you might still owe thousands of dollars for that criminal conviction. Now your license has been revoked. So mm -hmm. those, I'm not sure those clerk's offices and those agencies have quite figured out what this monetary impact is going to be on them, um, but. There will be some. There obviously. will be some, yeah, yeah there will mm -hmm. be some. Right. Some, but these people were not paying this money anyway. All it was doing was revolving the, the arrest cycle. Mm -hmm. Nobody was making millions of dollars off of these people. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. and, and, and that's where I think, let's talk about the money discussion, because I think that that's really important. And I think it goes to what you said earlier about New Orleans Police Department. You know, many of those folks had second and third jobs because the PD didn't pay. Right. Um, Drew was just talking about what's going on right now in Georgia. Um, that the, the prosecutor life expectancies back to three years, get this and, and head out. 
I too was one of those, uh, you know, that, that two years in the DA's office and then, then I'll, I'll go work for a firm. Um, 27.9 was, was my starting salary. Um, and, and when we got into some negotiations, In-N-Out Burger was uh, quite popular in California. We took the pay rates from In-N-Out Burger and we took what the Attorney Association, what would be paid the prosecutors, public defenders, and uh, county council. And it was pretty consistent with cashier, fry cook, uh, frontline supervisor, and we never got near what, what the uh, manager or general manager of an in-out burger uh, earned and, yeah. and thought like, okay, these are the folks that are making criminal justice decisions, and these are, these are the folks that, that make a great hamburger. But, let, me, um, let, me, let me offer the, 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 the contrary there for a moment because, you know, I was a U.S. attorney in New Orleans where, like much of the federal system, you've got a lot of career folks. You know, the, the salary that an AUSA earns in New Orleans is pretty good compared to what you might be able to make when you come out of private, come into private practice. And so as a result, I had about 50% of my office that had been there for 15 plus years. I had been an AUSA in Southern District of New York, where, where it's much more of a revolving door, as you're describing, and, and as it is in some of the larger, larger districts in the country. I would say that there was a, and I don't want to criticize one more than the other, but the reality is I think that there is a process of if you stay in the system for too long, you run the risk of becoming too jaded and too one-sided in your ability to assess what's fair and what's just. And so I think that that is, you know, when I was in the AUSA in Southern District of New York, although we were young, we were also empowered to do what was right, what we believed to be was the right thing. And we were so new out of the, new in and out of the system, having come from the defense side, going back to the defense side eventually, we understood that there was a balance and a perspective that you had to bring to the job as opposed to someone who had been in AUSA or a prosecutor for their entire legal career. Yeah, and that's, so that's very the, fair. Absolutely. And all I was trying to do is we're all in this together. We need to, in order to do things right, things have to slow down and there have to be the resources there. And the resources need to be there on both sides um, to, to get, get the rising boat to float. So um, uh, with, with regard to, uh, to resources, but, but let me just add one foot, footnote, and that is, as you, as you know, um, in Atlanta, when you were with us, uh, I gave the, uh, our organization's Champion of Justice Award to uh, former Deputy Attorney General of the United States, Sally Yates, for her work on the Clemency Project and to um, Nathan Deal, the governor of, of Georgia, um, who, as you re remember, cried when we presented him the award when he gave his remarks. Um, and so uh, our very uh, red, well, not marginally red state now, um, our governor has been a trendsetter in criminal justice reform and, and deserved to be rewarded, and he was. But um, I, on the, the financial aspect of it, and um, Vanessa's probably heard me do my spiel over and over again. Um, really, the primary reason I wanted to be the president of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, I, I'm plenty busy, I've got stuff to do. Uh, but my focal point, and it's somewhat fortuitous um, that, uh, that I'm here with folks from representing New Orleans and Memphis, because the, the main reason I did it is um, my concerns about the southeastern United States. Um, and I'm not talking about uh, Memphis and New Orleans and Atlanta and Nashville and Birmingham. Um, but I'm talking about um, small, rural, poor communities, in particular communities of color. Uh, all of us, if we are concerned um, about criminal justice reform and fairness in the system, need to take the time to think about those communities. And selfishly, I care about public defense providers uh, because if 82% of criminal cases are being handled by public defense providers, I'm going to go out on the limb, and you all can correct me, and say 99.9% .9 of the folks in these communities I'm talking about uh, need public defense pr providers. They need parity in pay. They need investigators. We, we social workers, they wouldn't need to, you know, the only ones that have more money than the clients are the lawyers, um, and they're poor also. And so these folks are getting crushed in these communities. And I'm from the South, and I've had to walk past the statue of the Confederate soldier to get into court. I have to go into courthouses where the bar of justice, you know, one side's all black, one side's all white. Um, and uh, you, can, you can 
you know, guess where it's white and where it's black. I mean, um, and these folks are getting crushed uh, and they have no chances. Uh, no one's talking about collateral consequences in these jurisdictions. No one's talking about reentry issues in these jurisdictions. No one's talking about diversion programs in these jurisdictions. Um, but when you all go back, and yes, I said you all to satisfy the Southern thing, because I never say it. <laughs> I say it right. I, I, I'm terrible. Doll. You can just yeah, I can't. I, I struggle with it. Um, head, head north again. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, when I uh, come to uh, a, an organization um, like APA, um, most important thing for me to get on this flight and to make sure that I'm here um, and not in Las Vegas today is to implore you when you go home to your respective states um, to think about those folks and think about what influence you can have in, in your states to make sure that these smaller communities um, are getting the proper funding um, so that uh, people in the community that are charged with crimes and, and often perpetrating crimes because of socioeconomic disadvantage are not plagued uh, for life. Um, the last two years, as Vanessa knows, uh, our past president, Rick Jones, you, you know Rick, right? Yeah, he's the um, executive director of the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. He and I have done, instead of a religious mission, we've done uh, a um, legal mission. And the impetus for that was Rick convened a few years ago these chief defenders of these offices into D.C. for 48 hours of listening to them. And they came in, um, they came in from Philadelphia, they came in from Cook County, from Houston, from Miami, from Palm Beach, from Michigan, from San Francisco. And these were like Hall of Fame offices, right? They have built-in translators, civil attorneys, immigration divisions. And you know, social workers nonstop. And we got done, and Rick, who's one of the greatest people I know, said, so what'd you think, dude? And I said, buddy, you need to get in a car with me, and you need to learn about what real life is about, because it's not, these are just Jones days and King and Spaulding's. Mm. And, and so Rick and I, for the last two years, uh, we have spent, um, we call them our legal mission trip, we start listening tours. We've been in Mississippi, we've been all over Alabama, and uh, we, we, we're going to Arkansas, and then we're going to uh, Native American re reservations. People are struggling, struggling. And they just don't need the defense bar. They probably, more importantly, need you. Um, and so I just want you to know that was the most important reason for me um, to come here and, and, and be on this panel. Amy, question from the audience. Um, do you measure whether your innovative practices uh, are working? If so, how? And interesting on the card, they also talked about how will the voters know it's working? Oh, well, I don't know. I'll tell you in 2022. <laughs> um, the, to the first question, yes, and that is a challenge, uh, data. Um, we as prosecutors, as you guys know, are all very good at anecdotal facts and information, but getting real hard data is another challenge. We have been, uh, we have partnered with an assessment team, which consists of a former prosecutor from Manhattan, uh, a former criminal defense attorney who's now a professor at American University, and they have been in our office uh, for the last year, poring over the data that we have and finding the holes in that data and doing an assessment of our office. So we'll, hopefully we'll have a better way of doing the, the, the data collection than we have in years past, but, um, Yes, we do the best we can with what we have, and we're working on improving that. Because it's really, I mean, to Knighton's talk and, and to everybody that, that, that does this work every day, it's everything. And then are you going to put that on your website? How, how is the public going to know? Yes, yeah, so the, the, the data on the driving are revoked, yes, we have shared that with the public, with the community. We, we rolled out the policy very quietly and then gathered the data and then shared it with the community. So we, we have. We've, but, you know, getting people to understand what does it mean to dismiss a bunch of warrants and understanding what that value is, I think the messaging is maybe more important than what the actual numbers tell you. Why does it matter that you just got rid of 45% of your general sessions docket? Well, here's why it matters to you, citizen of the community. Got it. Uh, next question, and I think this is kind of open to anybody in the panel. Has any state required that continuing education include training in behavioral health, uh, neuroscience, uh, normal development, trauma, or addiction? And I, and I assume, has, has any state, you're continuing legislate, let, for those that have CLE, of any of them requiring any, any state requiring anything like that? Not that I'm aware of. 
Oh, you're talking about for, for attorneys for specifically. Us. Yes, right? yeah, yeah, I would assume we're talking about attorneys. Yep. Yeah, that was my question. Yeah. It's not policy. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fair question. I, I would note that in Louisiana, at least, our in the city of New Orleans, our teachers, as well as as a result of the consent decree, our police department, both of those populations receive training in mental health and behavioral science and trauma informed care as part of their jobs. And again, our police department has made significant strides there. As we left the Department of Justice, I think we had 23 or so consent decrees nationwide. And it's really been that apparatus that's allowed us to implement those types of training requirements. I think nationally we have something like 15,000 different law enforcement agencies. We, we, the point is we can't consent decree our way to appropriate training and practices for law enforcement. So one of the things when you talk about, Drew, uh, going out and reaching some of those areas that aren't in the big cities. It's the same thing with improving law enforcement practices. Uh, it's the same thing when you're talking about implementing some of those very innovative concepts of behavioral health. The big cities are going to get it, but the reality is we do need to bring to the table some of those uh, individuals that really represent the broader scope of the country and where much much of this uh, implementation needs to happen. So, and, and let me respond, because you, you hit on a, a, an important global issue, and this requires us to go back to our state bars. I think anybody would, across the, you know, I've spoken all over the country, and I think everybody would agree that our state bar CLE requirements are antiquated uh, at this point. I mean, they contemplate a, a world that existed a half a century ago, um, and, and they don't take in the fact that some people have a specialized practice. I think that's where we can make the most impact. I mean, let's be candid. If you are prosecuting major crimes, I think you'd be, if you don't, if you don't know legal ethics um, and you're trying homicide cases and you have to spend two hours a year listening to a CLE lecture on ethics when you're really just tweeting and text messaging you know, your, your friends during it. Um, you should be required to have forensics. You know, you should be required if you're prosecuting or you're a public defender um, to do a certain amount of time to satisfy your state bar requirements on forensics or neuroscience or whatever that is. Um, but instead, you know, we sit around and listen and we listen at a CLE together to somebody talk about, you know, storytelling um, and that satisfies it. And um, so I think you hit an important global issue that I think falls really on state bar requirements. And then uh, as we're kind of closing up here, um, are the panelists persuaded, and I thought this was a great question when we talk about the innovations, that innovations are developed by prosecutors and defense counsel in the interest of crime victims? <laughs> is is the, that the consideration or is all of the innovative programs all about the offender? Because I think in that discussion and in the reforms, quite often the victims feel like they've been left out. 
Well, so. I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to, to jump on that. No, they are the center of everything th that we do. Um, I, don't, I, don't other, I don't know any other way to say that, but everything we do in our office and every prosecutor I know across the country, federal and state, that's what it's all about. We are their only voice, and we take that responsibility very seriously. Um, but again, I think a lot of this innovation, and I put quotes around it, because a lot of it's been going on for a long time. Drug court, mental health court, those types of uh, specialty courts have been in existence for decades. Um, that's all very much victim-centered. Um, there's not a restorative justice program in the country, I don't think, that would go down the path of restorative justice if the victim was adamantly opposed to that route being taken. So. Um, Everything we do in our office is very much victim-centered and victim-focused because it's we're their voice. And I'll, I'll touch on one additional program that uh, we created. It was called Crescent City Keepers. It was the only uh, U.S. attorney-led initiative that was part of the My Brother's Keeper umbrella under President Obama. Essentially, we used uh, social networking analysis, which, which some of you may be familiar with from uh, Papa Christos at Yale, where you analyze individuals and try to identify which individuals may be the next perpetrators. But that same science allows you to identify which individuals are likely to be the next victims of homicides in a particular city as well. We ran that within New Orleans and identified the 14 to 16-year-olds who are likely to be the next homicide victims on the streets of New Orleans. And instead of waiting for that potential victim population to show up on a police report or to show up in a coroner's slab, unfortunately, which unfortunately some of them did, what we did was we took those individuals and paired them with one individual, one individual youth with one individual organization in the city of New Orleans, whether it was a church or a fraternity or a sorority or, or in one case, even the Tulane Law School Law Review served as that organization where they provided mentors, they provided resources, whether it was academic, whether it was housing, whether it was simply providing food and sustenance for these young people and their families. And the entire, the entire organization essentially tried to replicate a new community of support and safety to help with the ultimate goal, which was to save the life of that young person. And so that program, Crescent City Keepers, was very much focused on preventing young people in the city of New Orleans become, from becoming the next victims on our streets. So my, my response to that question is, uh, is twofold. One, as um, the president of NACDL, I've been, uh, have had the platform to be able to be interviewed by the Washington Post and New York Times about Marcy's Law, and I've been a, a big opponent to Marcy's Law. And uh, as my quote that um, a lot of my prosecutor friends read, said in over 30 years of defending cases, um, I may have gone nose to nose with a lot of prosecutors in Georgia and around the country, but I've never known one prosecutor in my career to disrespect a victim of a crime. Um, and it's just because a billionaire in California wants to swing around a lot of cash and push legislation, um, I didn't think that we didn't have a, a, you know, an amendment, and it particularly hit home in my state, where it was, um, it was uh, a sales pitch on our on our, uh, our ballot and mm -hmm. the way it was written it was just a sales pitch. Um, now, with that being said, when a prosecutor, from my perspective, makes an assessment of whether or not a case is worthy of being transferred to a veterans court, to a drug court, to a diversion court, or this amazing thing I saw, uh, the, the 18 to 20 court, or um, you heard Sean LaGruer in Fulton County Superior Court in Georgia have a violent crime court. Um, when you're the prosecutor, um, part of the challenge, from my perspective, having gone against the best of the best, is to make a call. And if you think that somebody is worthy of going to a diversion program in a victimless crime because they're, they, you know, they did a throwdown crack case, and you think they're worthy of a diversion, then uh, in, in a residential burglary case, I'm sorry that the family feels like they can't get a good night's sleep forever. Um, but if you think that a person in the drug case deserves a second chance and deserves a forgive and forget, then you have to make that call. And you can't pass it off and say, well, the victim doesn't want it, so your person's going to have to have a conviction and be unable to be employed for the next half a century. 
Um, that's just a tough call, but to me, it's part of the game. It's part of the profession that the, 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 the honorable profession that you choose to be a, a prosecutor. And I was asked this question um, at Emory Law School um, the other day. You know, are you saying, do you think that, you know, we shouldn't be prosecutors? And I'm saying, no. I think it's an honorable profession that needs the best of the best. But part of being the best of the best is you got to make game time decisions, man. You just got to be able to make them. Tough way to make a living, but I say all the time, got to have intestinal fortitude to be on both sides of this equation. And I think that is a, a, a great close to this uh, concept of, of how do we work together. Also in my mind, I, you mentioned Sean Wildegru, uh, a mentor court where it is violent cases that are going in. There are even cases involving guns. And, and Dan Satterberg, my understanding is some of your Peace Circle cases are now, um, there, there's some guns in there too. So there are the concern about, you know, to do something. You mentioned President Obama saying no guns, no sex. Some of these offices are, are doing that very different thing. And Dan's person on the Peace Circle, that's what goes to my mind, because a lot of those are the juvenile cases. His thing is, what do you think you're teaching the kid by taking him to court? Court is another adversarial. He's already done something. And now you're pushing that kid into an adversarial process. You get a defense lawyer, everybody goes and fights. Isn't it important? And I think this morning you said three days to sit around and talk to adults. Um, what, what does that teach the kid? And is there the chance that, that you, can, you can change the behavior? So thank you to all for being willing to, to sit here. And we'll switch right to the next risk assessment panel.